Well, today's a wonderful day because we're going to do a topic called trigonometric substitution, which does what? It combines the ideas of trigonometry and the ideas of substitution. And we put them together and we get a wonderful tool. And it can help us solve one of our biggest challenges, namely the square root, which is often at the root of some of the hardest integrals that we have to encounter. So let's begin. So we begin by saying, well, where is the square root coming from? Why do we even care so much about the square root? Well, we actually care about the square root for a very important reason, because calculus is motivated by geometry. And we say, okay, since calculus is motivated by geometry, we have to make sure we can answer geometrical questions. And one of the most fundamental things we have to talk about in geometry is distance, how far apart things are. And we say, well, look, if I have a point and we describe them by coordinates, x0, y0, and another point, x1, y1, then the distance by Pythagorean theorem is the square root of change in x squared plus change in y squared. Okay, so far so good. So we see, aha, square roots are there for a very important reason. They show up in distance and distance shows up in many, many applications. So we need to learn to deal with the square root. And we say, okay, well, wouldn't it be nice if we said, ah, the square root of a squared plus b squared, wouldn't it be wonderful if it was just a plus b? And uh, no. No, it's not. And uh, you have to be careful here. Now, why is it not a good thing? Well, if it were, well, that would put a lot of calculus teachers out of a job because math would be too easy, too simple. But really what it boils down to is this idea of addition and taking things to a power are not interchangeable. And in other words, it, it matters which order you do things. So that's why we can't just say, oh, let me take the square root and then let me take add versus, oh, let me add and take a square root. The end results are not the same. So we, we can't just say, all right, take the square root of each piece. Now, some of the problems that we did where we had square roots, we were saying, oh, well, what can we do? Well, one of our great ideas was to say, hey, wouldn't it be lovely if we had the square root of something squared? You see, we like this because that is something that we know how to handle. If I just see the square root of something squared, life is good. So you might say, ah, too bad. A squared plus B squared is not a perfect square. But now we have to start thinking, what can we do? So our goal, let's find a way to get rid of the square root. Now that's our stated goal. But I want to actually tell you that there's sort of a, a sort of a more subtle goal that comes into play. And I want to say what it is, just so we know it, should we ever run across it in the near future. So the subtle goal is the following. It says, look, uh, have a way to handle addition. And you might say, well, wait, addition is great. We love addition. Well, we love addition in certain places. We don't like addition in inconvenient places. So in our case, where we talk about have a way to handle addition, when we talk about trig substitution, we're really talking about in the square root. So how do you handle things inside of a square root? But there are other places where we might have addition where things can get messy. And so you'll see this is a theme that's going to show up over several different sessions. For instance, a little bit of a spoiler perhaps, when we get into the topic of partial fractions, it's the same problem. How do we handle addition? How do we get rid of it in a nice way? So we kind of know the answer, right? We said the perfect thing to do would be what? Well, the perfect thing would be to say it's not a squared plus b squared, but rather it's just something squared, maybe C squared? Oh, okay. Well, that would be great. So now we start thinking, okay, what can we do to make something like a square plus a square 
into a perfect square, maybe a square minus a square, into a perfect square. So if we think about, well, the square root came because of the distance formula. The distance formula came because of the Pythagorean theorem. The good news is the Pythagorean theorem giveth our problem, but it also taketh it away. By using the Pythagorean theorem, we can actually find ways to get rid of the square roots. The key are the Pythagorean identities. So things like 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared, or 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared, or secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. In other words, what do you see here? Well, this is really, this 1, it's really 1 squared. A square minus a square. It turns out it's a perfect square. A square plus a square turns out a perfect square. A square minus a square turns out can be a perfect square if it's the right kind of form. So we say, aha, let's find something to help us make things into the right kind of form. So here we go. This is what we have, trigonometric substitution. And our idea is, we say, look, the Pythagorean theorems have great ways to turn a sum of two squares or a difference of two squares into a single square, which we can then use to simplify our expression, in particular, help get rid of square roots. All right, so how does it work? Well, if you see a number square, so I'm going to think of a as a number and u as a variable. Now, of course, when we say u as a variable, it could be more than just x, or it could be u. It could be any kind of expression. But, all right, what happens? Well, if we see the square root of a squared minus u squared, the idea is to say, ooh, this kind of feels like, this, see, this a squared minus u squared, it, it feels like, kind of like, 1 minus sine squared. In other words, a number minus something squared. You see, the key idea here is a is a fixed value. u is the thing that can vary. So we said, oh, if we could rewrite that, that u to make it look like a sign, life is good. So we'll do that. So we substitute u equals a sine theta. And now what do we get? Well, what we get is we, we get the following. It's actually equal to a squared minus a sine theta squared. Okay, well, notice that that has an a squared, that has an a squared. So it becomes a squared times 1 minus sine squared. And you say, okay, 1 minus sine squared, Pythagorean identity becomes cosine squared. Perfect. Perfect. We're able to take two terms, a constant term, subtract a varying term, and turn it into a single term with a new function. And now I can handle the square root. In particular, the square root of a squared minus u squared becomes a cosine theta. Now, technically, there's a little bit of, uh, you have to worry about humming and hawing, which you might say, well, what about absolute values? And for us, I'm just going to say, we're not going to worry about absolute values, but if you like to be paranoid, you can, you can put little quote marks here and say, okay, that's me being paranoid. I am just one of those really extra careful, lots of precaution type people. Perfectly fine. Now, that's one situation. So, number squared minus variable squared, substitute it so that our variable looks like a sign. And therefore, we can get rid of our, our subtraction sign in the middle and handle square roots. If I have number squared plus variable squared, okay, a squared plus u squared, or of course it could be u squared plus a squared either way, well, we say, okay, substitute in tangent. So when we do that, what happens? We get a squared plus a squared tangent squared. Don't worry about the a squared, say so work out. One plus tangent squared, secant squared. So the substitution helps us collapse. The, the sum becomes a single term, and life is good. The last thing, well, what if we have variable squared 
subtract a number. Okay, so this part is varying subtract a number, u squared minus a squared. Well, that's the substitution secant. Well, what happens? Well, what really happens, what do you get? It really becomes secant squared minus 1. And secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. And we know how to handle that. And therefore, we get out tangent. Good. And uh, all right, that's pretty much the idea. So the whole fundamental idea of trigonometric substitution is to make a substitution to turn or rather, you can say, introduce trigonometry into the problem. So one way you can view it is, is along the lines of the following. You're saying, well, we're starting with something which is probably using algebra, you know, square root of something or, or square root of x squared minus 4. I don't know. There's some algebraic stuff going on. And then by doing the trig substitution, we're turning our problem from algebra into trigonometry. So in other words, we're changing our setting. Why are we doing that? Well, we're doing it because the Pythagorean identities help us have a way to handle the square roots that we can collapse it and something nice happens. So that's what's happening with our trig substitution, is we're really turning our problem from one type of setting into another type of setting. In other words, turn it into a problem where we have better tools. Now, it's important to make sure we have our, our trig down correctly. So we need to understand things like how do sine, cosine, tangent, and secant relate to triangles. So you might remember there's this old saying that students like, Sokotoa, and if you remember that, that's fine, and if you don't, that's fine too. So in case you are wondering, what is Sokoto? It's a silly nonsense word. That shorthand for what? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine, adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent, opposite over adjacent. And so it tells you the relationships in triangles. And in particular, we, we have the following. So this is important to understand when we're making our substitution. So suppose we make a substitution u equals a sine theta. Well, what does that mean? Well, whenever we have a substitution like this, we say, oh, the, the theta, it's an angle. Now we're turning it so that the theta is the part that varies. So it, we can think of that as theta as being an angle. We can think of it as the angle in a corner of the triangle. So we have a triangle, and we put theta in the corner. And we say, all right, well, if I make my substitution, u is a sine theta, that really says sine of theta is u over a. So think of it as opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite, hypotenuse. And what's the missing side? Well, if you use the Pythagorean theorem, the missing side is the square root of a squared minus u squared. And you might think, wait a second, we saw the square root of a squared minus u squared before. You're right, we did. We said, hey, if you see square root of a squared minus u squared, that's the substitution to make. Not a coincidence, not a coincidence. Now, how do you find theta? Well, that's not hard. It's the arc sine of u over a. But maybe you don't need theta. Maybe as you do the problem, you get to the end and say, oh, I need something like cosine of theta. Well, that's no problem. You read it off from the picture. Cosine theta square root of a squared minus u squared over a. So the, this picture that you draw with the triangle is a very important picture because it allows you to, at the end, after you've, you've done your work, right? So let's go back to our diagram. We'll, we'll, we'll sketch it again. So we have our algebra problem, and then we transform it. This is our trig sub, and we transform it into a trig problem. So in particular, when I talk about a trig problem, I'm talking about, hey, something involving trigonometry. And now we can solve. And we can do that by saying, look, by transforming the integral into a trigonometric integral, now I have something I know how to answer. Great. So now I have my trig solution in some sense. 
Now, if we're doing a definite integral, that's great. Because remember, whenever we do a definite integral, what's the idea? Is we update the bounds as we go. So we always move forward. We never move back. With, with definite integrals, no, always move forward. Keep updating the bounds, and then you're done. But if it's an indefinite integral, we have to go back. So what we do is we say, OK, what's this step over here to get us to our algebraic solution? Well, what we have to do is convert our answer, which will involve trigonometric terms, very likely, into something which is algebraic. And that's why you want these triangles. The triangles are helping you figure out, oh, what do things become? How do I think about these things? And uh, so we just talked about that one. So anyways, what's the whole point? At the end of the day, we really get to say, look, this is what we really wanted to do. We have an algebraic problem. We wanted to get our, our answer. But what we do is we jump over and do things into trigonometry and jump back. The reason we do it is because it turns into an easier problem. It's the reason we do anything in calculus. We are trying to make things simpler on ourselves. It's a wonderful approach, not just to calculus, but to life. Make things easier, and then we get a better situation. Now, if you have the, the u equals a tangent theta, OK, tangent theta is u over a. Tangent is also opposite over adjacent. And so now you have the two legs of the triangle. Pythagorean gives you the missing side. Square root of a squared plus u squared. No surprise, when we see a squared plus u squared, we're thinking tangent as our substitution. If we have secant of theta, secant of theta would be u over a. So secant, well, just flip cosine. So normally, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Flip, you get hypotenuse over adjacent. u a. Missing side, square root of u squared minus a squared. And life is good. So we pretty much have the idea. It's all laid out. So what do we do? If we have square roots, and we said, look, factoring doesn't do it for us. There's no perfect square. There's no substitution. That seems simple. And then we say, OK, good. Now we pull out our trig substitution, our idea. Look at the what's inside the square root. And, and think about it. You might have to do some completing the square. So, so be careful here. So keep in mind that there might be an extra step here called complete the square. So you want to have the, what's inside the square root look like something of the form square root of a squared minus u squared or square root of u squared plus a squared or square root of u squared minus a squared. So in other words, you want one of these forms here. But what if you had something like this? What if you had the square root of x squared plus 2x? And then you're saying, well, all right, I can't do trig substitution there, right? Well, the problem is you can't make your, it's not a square plus or minus a square. Not yet, but we have ways. So what are our ways? Well, we can say, look, complete the square. Because really, trig substitution is dealing for sums of squares or difference of squares. So you could do something like this. You say, well, look, x squared plus 2x. If I added one more, I'd have a perfect square. I would. It would be x plus 1 squared. Well, I can't just add 1 arbitrarily. So what I do is I say, well, look, I'll add 1, then immediately subtract 1, which is the equivalent to adding 0. You can add 0. You can add 0 as much as you want. No problem. And so it becomes square root of x plus 1 squared minus 1, which is 1 squared. So there's our u squared minus a squared. We think back to our forms and say, aha, this part, my u, this is my a. So our substitution is to let u equal a secant theta, which says x plus 1 equals secant theta. And away we go, off to the races. So that's why we say, look, look at the form and make sure 
you replace all the variables. Um, that's inside you have to complete the square. But when we say all the variables, what does that mean? Well, you might have like an over an x cubed. Okay, well look, you can handle the inside. That's, a, you know, uh, well, okay. Let's make it x plus one cubed, just, just to make it so it's clean. You might say, look, I now know what to do on the inside, but also make sure you get that x plus one cubed downstairs. That's what we mean. In other words, do what you do on substitution. You can't just say, ooh, I'll fix one problem and I'll leave everything else unchanged. You gotta change everything and, uh, well, things will work out. Now, okay, so we make the appropriate substitution. We've transformed our, our algebra into trig. So instead of an algebraic integral, now it's a trig integral. Okay, well, what do you do? You do the integral. You say, hey, it's a trig integral, but it should be a relatively more easy trig integral. So you do that. And now it's your chance to say, thank goodness we, we did that practice with all those trig integration problems so that we can be good at doing that. Finally, you said, okay, I've gotten my answer. If it's a definite integral and you've been updating your bound, you're done. If it's you need to go back, so that's why if needed, so if it's an indefinite integral, draw the triangle and replace the trigonometric functions as needed. And that's it. It's actually not so bad. Once we understand that the idea is to say, oh, let's make a change so that we can use trig functions to help us get rid of square roots, and we're going to substitute to help us do that, then the motivation makes sense, and then it comes down to practice. Practice, practice, practice. So, time to go and do some practice. All right, hope to see you soon.